Good evening, everyone. We are live here with you and wishing you so much joy and festivities. I'm playing very tacky music and having a bit of crack here with Mark before we went live. So you're all so welcome. And I'm just delighted to see the chat function already going. I'll turn off the music for now, but it's, it's a bit of fun. It is the Christmas uh, season and this webinar this evening is designed to really help you to the best of our ability to create a happy and healthy mindset for the festive period. So in terms of using the chat function, it is there for you to really um, to be involved, to let us know any questions that you have. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see there's already some questions have come in. And um, so you can upvote your favorite questions um, or the ones that you find are most pertinent for you. And then Mark will answer them at the end. So thank you for being here, Mark. I'm just absolutely delighted to have you here with me this evening. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, Fiona. And I think events like this are always a great opportunity to, you know, showcase some ideas in the area of positive health and lifestyle as medicine and you know with the interaction we're going to create hopefully create some stimulating conversation and my goal with doing these events is always that someone you know when they leave uh we hope people will have a good experience here but for me what's most important is that tomorrow morning or maybe next monday morning there's the possibility that things could be a little bit different that they might take maybe one small idea on board something they either start doing or even something that they stop doing mm -hmm. that enables them to perhaps be kinder to themselves and those people that matter this Christmas season and to make a long term sustainable difference in their health and well-being. For me, that's kind of what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. I think you're so spot on there in terms of it could be just one person might take one thing and another person could take something else completely different. That's but the it. point is that 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 they take something. Isn't that right? So, Mark, just to, to get the conversation started, this is, is basically a series of webinars, as you know, that I'm hosting. Uh, the first one was a couple of months ago with Pat Devley, and I'm sure quite a few people maybe attended that as well. And really, the whole um, sort of ethos behind the webinars is about building emotional resilience. So for me, I think it's worth looking at, at what that is, because again, it is very subjective and I'm really interested to hear what it is for you. So in the first webinar, I spoke about this idea of an unshakable core, a feeling that one can manage or cope with whatever life's challenges are thrown at them, for example. And this evening, what I thought, what, what occurred to me, another part of emotional resilience for me is a feeling of equanimity. And that's a word that we hear quite often in, you know, spiritual teaching, the Buddhist teachings, etc. But maybe not necessarily. I certainly didn't know exactly what it meant for, for quite a while. So what is that equanimity? It sounds good. I'd love to know what it is. And basically, that sense of not being attached, I think, is really um, very powerful. So not being attached to our emotions, whether they are negative, when we're going down a spiral, which we know is very easily done in terms of anxiety, in terms of fear, or for example, when we feel good, it's great to feel good, but what we want to do is not be too attached to that feeling. And that's something that I've seen so often, both in myself and with my clients, is that let's say somebody is feeling better, they're feeling more positive, they're feeling calmer, that's fantastic. However, what can happen, and I've seen it, as I say, so many times, is that when a person becomes attached to that feeling, the very thing that they want starts to, 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 to slip away from them because now they're in a striving state. So equanimity is incredibly important for emotional resilience because we have the ability to, to have a place inside of ourselves that is like an inner sanctuary, if you like, that is the observer or the silent witness that can observe both the negative and the positive emotions without that attachment. So that's just something that I think can be very useful, uh, especially for Christmas in particular, in terms of there's a lot of 
you know, such a mixed bag of emotions, isn't there, um, Mark, in terms of people are full of excitement, joy, but also a feeling perhaps of fear, tensions, uh, family dy dynamics, um, financial issues, etc. And I want to look at a few of those today. But in the, the true spirit of positive psychology, what we do is we we, we turn our attention to what's, what's good and what's working and how we can really um, build on that. And I'm particularly delighted that you're here this evening because I'm studying at the moment in the positive health course in the Royal College of Surgeons. And your mm -hmm. name, Mark, is one that often is... Uh, you know, that we speak about or comes up in lectures, for example. And your TED talk was one that we had to, to watch as part of our curriculum. So I feel very honored to have you here this evening. And I think there's probably some students as well uh, with me on the course who are here this Great. evening. Yes, Farmageddon and a, a pill for every ill. And we, we all have the, the lingo. So what you might do, Mark, is I'm going to stop talking because I, I, you can see I'm talking quite a lot. So I'm going to stop talking. And I really want to, to listen to, first of all, what is emotional resilience to you? And maybe in the chat function, people might um, put in what it is for them. So for you, Mark, what, what would you say it is? Well, you know, there's so much you can say about emotional resilience. It's such a fascinating topic. I, I think at its essence, Fiona, it's being able to be agile enough to, as you said, be aware of how you're feeling, to appreciate that you are separate from the any emotion you're experiencing, whether it's good or not so good. And really to have that inner reservoir, I suppose, of positivity that enables you to firstly make the best of the good times mm -hmm. and be able to really celebrate those and appreciate those great people around you in your life. And secondly, to have the resilience to deal with the inevitable setbacks and struggles and tough times that life brings for each and every one of us as well. So it's it's the best of both, really. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right about Christmas. I mean, Christmas is a wonderful time of the year for many people. Mm -hmm. Time of family, time of celebration, time of, you know, connection. Uh, on top of all the traditions and so on. But it's also a time when many people feel under a lot of pressure. As you said, whether it's financial pressure, there's the additional pressure in these times of, you know, posed by COVID and people not being able to travel as easily, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think more importantly than anything now in the era of social media, there's the pressure to to match up, the pressure to be seen to be not just good enough, but in some cases, the pressure to be perfect. To put on yeah. the perfect Christmas dinner, have the perfect everything. Yes. And of course, perfectionism is uh, is an illusion, really, and can cause a lot of emotional and psychological distress, as you know. Mm -hmm. The beautiful Wabi Sabi saying that says, uh, you know, there's a, the, it's about the crack in the vase, the mm -hmm. blemish in the painting that, that adds to rather than takes away from the intrinsic beauty of something so we're all imperfect we're all flawed because we're all human <laughs> yes and that's, well, that's the way it should be of course as we know oh no <laughs> i i got plenty of flaws perfect, actually <laughs> she told me that and i believed her <laughs> uh, um, and yeah. i think emotional resilience then is really you know it's a really interesting idea um because you can look at it in terms of what's happened in society over the last couple of hundred years so i mean i think really since the industrial revolution you know, as people began to work in big groups in, in factories and industries and so on, everything was looking at looked at in terms of output and production and productivity and productive capacity and so on. People were looked at as, as units of employment. Um, and then secondly, if you look at historically, going back to the 1800s, you know, to express emotion was considered to be a very feminine trait. If you were a masculine, if you were a male, if in the world you were logical, you were assertive, you were authoritative, mm -hmm. and you certainly didn't do emotions. You certainly didn't have a kind of, let's call it a soft side. And, yeah. and these things were called soft skills and they were talk, talked about in terms of, you know, um, something that that you, you didn't use day in and day out. But now we know really that to have emotional resilience and emotional intelligence is really, it's it's, well, they've shown it's it's far more uh, predictive of long term career success mm -hmm. than IQ. But more importantly, in terms of, you know, communicating with others and in terms of 
being authentic in the world and being value based and expressing things like courage and vulnerability and authenticity. Th this is really where we're moving now in the 21st century and emotional resilience is going to be a key part of that. I think so, Mark. Yeah, there's some lovely comments coming in here. Um, Danny uh, says, hello, Danny. She says, being able to feel my feelings and not be overwhelmed by them is mm. for this is how she would see uh, emotional resilience. Uh, Mag says, being able to deal with tough times and also appreciate and enjoy good times. Exactly what you were saying there earlier. Mm. Gorgeous. So everyone is, is, is really uh, engaged and that's lovely. Keep the comments coming in because they're so useful. Um, I, think, Kandula, I think the other thing... Yeah, I think the other thing, Fiona, sorry for cutting across you there, Not at um, all. is to really appreciate the difference between negative and a positive emotion, because there's a huge there's a world of difference between them. I mean, we're uh, because of how our brains are designed in terms of the architecture of the brain inside your skull, we're hardwired for fear, anxiety and survival. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we will take happiness and positivity as an optional extra, but really, you know, being tuned into into fearful situations being tuned into danger is what kept us alive and our brain on the inside hasn't changed compared to the primitive man in terms of being the hunter gatherer mm -hmm. as a result we're hardwired for negativity we can't help it that's mm -hmm. our default position and you know negative emotion is like is like velcro it sticks mm -hmm. um as i said in my prescription for happiness book a few years ago it's like passive smoking it can be yes. that toxic for not just for yourself, but for those people around you. On the other hand, positive emotions are more like Teflon. They're mm -hmm. fleeting and um, <laughs> they're transitory. They come and they go. And, you know, to flourish, this is this big term now in terms of, you know, living at your best and being the best version of you, not the perfect version, but being the best version that, that you can be um, throughout your life. You need to have a ratio of at least three positive emotions to one negative. In other words, you need to have the right, what's called positivity balance. This is all the work done by Barbara Fredrickson. She's a brilliant she positive is. psychologist, you know, you'll be, yeah. you'll be aware of. And of course, most people, um, you know, maybe are only at that about two to one or two and a half to one, a lot of good things going on, but some bad stuff burning yes. them up as well. Yeah. And I suppose getting back to your point about emotional resilience, it's being able to identify Mm -hmm. and accept the negative emotions where appropriate obviously address anxiety whether you need to go to your doctor or go for therapy or whatever it might be mm -hmm. um you know understand what's the root source of these emotions you're experiencing um and deal with them as best you can don't suppress them don't repress them don't ignore them don't stick your head in the sand don't mm -hmm. pretend they don't exist mm -hmm. but use everyday habits very it can be very very small little things i'm sure we'll come on to some of them whether it's a gratitude practice kindness a mindful practice stilling the mind exercise whatever it is mm -hmm. to build regular i call them micro moments of positivity throughout your day mm -hmm. that will keep, keep that tipping point of positivity up mm -hmm. over three to one and if you consistently do that mm -hmm. um you will have more emotional resilience to make the best of good times and have the reservoir and buffer to support you when times get tough as they inevitably do for all of us. Absolutely, Mark. And that's the thing. It's like as much as negativity is a downward spiral, there is the upward spiral of positivity mm. and how we can literally, you know, change our brains through neuroplastic change to to be more positive and that we can put that conscious effort into it. I think is I always think it's very empowering. Um, and I, I just, just want to say you... there, sorry, Mark, in the polls, just to, if anyone mm. wants to put into the polls there, there's two polls and I'm just, we're getting some votes in, but let everyone vote. Are you looking forward to Christmas this year and do you feel overwhelmed by it? So let's see what comes in. I'll read them in a moment. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you there, Mark. What were you, what no. were you going to say? Because that's one of the downsides I find about online talks in general is that I, I always, I always hate interrupting anybody. Um, <laughs> But when you're when you're online with somebody, you, it's hard to pick up on the nonverbal nuances. It so is. sometimes you'll come in. And do you find that? Yeah, I think we're getting better at it, though. I think if we were to mm -hmm. have done this even one year ago, it would have been mm -hmm. a lot more jerky and awkward. I think mm -hmm. we are. It's a skill. I think our brains are probably changing and we're, we're yeah. becoming better at it. Um, let's well, let's see, Mark. I might keep interrupting you. You'll be like, she's talking nonsense. <laughs> but the, um, the point, I, the point yeah. I was going to make was 
somebody has coined this phrase toxic positivity, which I think is a really it's a really good point because mm -hmm. sometimes people mistake this idea about positive psychology and mm -hmm. positive health, et cetera, happiness, et cetera, mm -hmm. as being that you the sort of you have to be positive all the time mm -hmm. and, you know, just snap out of it and just think your way out of any negative emotions you have. And of course, because of the, the architecture of your brain, your emotional center, your amygdala always sort of they supersede the wiring there is much stronger than what's in your prefrontal cortex. So you can't logically think your way out of of how you feel. Mm -hmm. And nobody is talking about being positive all the time mm. um, or believing you have to be toxic. You hear the you know, there's a tsunami coming in five minutes. Oh, let's all celebrate. You know, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think language is in this space is very important as well. It is yes. to back up what you talk about with with the evidence. And for me, as a, as a doctor, Mm -hmm. I was very interested in well-being and vitality. It's all about the science for me. It's all about the evidence. Uh, I'm willing to discuss anything for which there's an evidence base, but there has to be science and evidence backing it up first. Which is what's great about positive psychology is that it is so, mm. so um, backed up and empirical. Um, so, Mark, on that note, maybe you might tell everybody here this evening and viewers later on, what is your background in terms of your, obviously you're a GP, um, but what is it that, caused you what was it that really brought you out of let's say the more mainstream or traditional um practice into the area of lifestyle medicine and positive psychology like what was it that drove that change i think there was i think there was two real there was two real sort of um events that sort of put me on that path it wasn't a sort of a lightning hit by lightning moment but it's it, that it put me on the path the first was um we started our practice in 1999 um with four people and we, we've 26 today so it's grown a lot over the years and when we've been in business about almost a year to the day um we and people who listen to my ted talk will, will hear this um i got a call at my door early one morning and you mark wrote the doctor yes you better come quick your practice is on fire and i ran over there mm -hmm. and you know everything i'd worked so hard for uh all my dreams all my sort of ideas of my practice, my future were there going up in smoke in front of my eyes. And mm. I mean, that was a really tough time. Mm. Uh, initially, I felt numb. And then we got into automatic pilot. We were back in business two days later uh, nearby. You know, the, you dusted yourself down. You were a doctor. You got on with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, nobody was was convicted of the fire. You know, there was people telling me all sorts of things. There was mm. CCTV footage found two guys had broken in. It, was, it wasn't a, an, a, an electrical fault. It was it was a deliberate arson. And was, I was consumed for weeks afterwards with why. Mm. And, uh, you know, would they come to my home next? Who are they? Mm. What had I done to deserve this? I've grown up across the road from where my practice was. Mm. And eventually I learned that I had to let go of that. And the day I, I chose to let go of the need to know why and chose to move on, it was one of the best things I ever did because I learned that you can't turn back the clock in life. Um, you have to be able to dust yourself down. And we all face fires in our lives, you know, whether it's a fire in your, in your finances or a fire in your health, fire in your relationships, fire in your career. Everybody, everybody experiences pain in life and everybody suffers. And, you know, nobody got hurt in the fire. This was only sort of a building, right? But for me, it, it, it felt like so much more. The injustice can, of it, I imagine, was hard at the time to, to carry. Was, why, As you say, why did this happen? And trying to understand yeah, it. It was very tough at the time. And uh, people were telling me all sorts of things, which at the end of the day didn't make any material difference. Mm -hmm. But I can look back at that fire now, and it's, it's, it's 21 years ago now. So it's, you know, but it seems like yesterday in my mind in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for that fire. I'm so grateful for that experience because it taught me so much about resilience and mm -hmm. that, you know, it doesn't matter what happens. It's how you choose to respond. Mm -hmm. And that's a very powerful idea mm -hmm. that it fundamentally is. we have the power to choose. Um, so I think that sort of was a kind of a thing that happened along the way. And then that galvanized me into building our own place. And we... I bought a convent building in 2006 that was owned by the Presentation Order of Nuns and restored it to become a big primary care center in the heart of my community. 
and it's an amazing place anyone that's listening i give you all an open invitation to come down and see it sometime there's a lovely coffee shop vegetarian cafe healing garden on the inside there's a lot of social prescribing on site before covid there was a lot of educational talks built that and we moved in there in 2009 just as the kind of financial tsunami uh started with the with the with the bank crash and i was seeing so many people who were really stressed out i mean hundreds um we tragically we had um nine people lost their lives to suicide between 2010 and 2013 but i'd count this others who were really distressed uh, young people with no financial commitments who lost their jobs they 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 emigrated they went to america they went to or you know england australia whatever particularly in construction and so on but there was a lot of people trapped with mortgages with families with commitments mm -hmm. and they had the kind of i suppose the relentless ongoing pressure mm -hmm. and that's when i realized you know i i needed to learn new skills to help people in in this situation that you know people needed more than say pills or prozac even though sometimes if people are very depressed medication can be can be fantastic so I'm, i don't want people to say i'm anti-medication but i'm just saying people needed more people needed a sense of hope and that's when i began to look at positive psychology and really began to look at you know the benefits of keeping a written journal the benefits of expressing gratitude the benefits of you know the best possible future self exercise where you cultivate that sense of realistic optimism and all these types of exercises very simple things to recommend uh, and also lifestyle practices spending time in nature benefits mm -hmm. of exercise and movement mindfulness all that type of thing all these very simple ideas mm. timeless practices really that have been kind of i suppose forgotten uh in modern healthcare over the past hundred years bringing those back in not a case of instead of conventional medicine but alongside so the mm -hmm. best of both and really and yes. it, i found people really began to respond to this message and i began to implement a lot of these practices myself in my own life mm -hmm. because we were cut 40 percent uh by the government in the they were the famous what are called fempi cuts to general practice about 10 years ago and at that stage employing 26 people uh with a big convent building and being cut 40 percent off the top wasn't easy mm -hmm. uh, it was very challenging we'd we had a few tough years but we got through it all thankfully mm -hmm. and we're you know on a great footing today but so those learning those skills was invaluable for me but more particularly for my patients uh, and isn't those skills mark that you feel got you through like when you say we got through it thankfully do you feel it, it is actually the the fact that you applied a lot of what you were learning and your research into positive mm. psychology and lifestyle medicine that actually were a big part of getting you through if you like in terms of your own health and well-being at its optimum that that helped you to cope oh absolutely and mm. you know I, i'm a great believer in this idea this phrase i have be an active participant in your own well-being as opposed to being a passive consumer of healthcare and what that means is you know take action yourself and i think that's really important if you're if you're a doctor and you're trying to advise or support people it's really important that you have a consistency and i suppose an authenticity in terms of what you're talking about or what you're doing mm -hmm. people are very smart people are very perceptive people see the chinks mm -hmm. people see when you're advising something but you're not really doing it yourself you know if you're telling people to exercise but you're Exactly. you know you're not exercising you know i mean if there's a consistent inconsistency there with that so you, so absolutely so I, you know i've found over the last number of years certainly some of those positive psychology exercises the gratitude practice mm -hmm. mm -hmm. self-compassion mm. i mean going through medical school um very testing very rigorous mm. and you know it, it, it it's like a magnet attracting in not just high achievers, but often, I suppose, over overachievers, the perfectionistic type mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, medical school and medicine in general is very un, it's very non compassionate in terms of to the, certainly to students and young doctors. It's very non forgiving, I suppose, is the term. And yeah. you're expected to be superhuman. And I think learning to be compassionate to yourself as a giver and as a carer is, is actually so, so important.
Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Because in order for you to care for others, and that's a message I, I often share mm. and do believe in practicing what I preach, I really do, because you're not in a position to help anybody else. If you are, you know, operating from, from a deficit, you need to be really mm. at your optimum. And that means taking care of, of yourself. And so one of the things I was doing then was it was I was on the board of a, of a local theater company because I'm a great oh. believer in giving back to your community and that this was a number yeah. of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I came up with this mad idea that I would do a a show for World, World Mental Health Day. This was in 2013. So I did a prescription for happiness show. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with a producer, Jim Nolan here, a brilliant guy. And um, I so I had a, yeah. I had a one. I had a one and a half hour script, two acts with a break in the middle. And wow. I did that in 2013. That went around Ireland. I did it in Dublin a few times. I went to Galway and Clare. So you just were actually in the park, were you? It's just me. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'd say and, you were um, brilliant, I can imagine. It'd be fantastic. Then people, then people started saying, well, where's the book? So, so what happened then was I took some time out and I wrote my book, A Prescription for Happiness. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of then moved me into doing some kind of workshops uh, on well-being and um, keynotes, that type of thing. My TED talk, as you said, then was in 2017. Mm -hmm. And just more recently, I've developed a kind of a measure of well-being called Vitality Mark, which is just sort of come out of beta and that's going to market now. And I'm starting my own self-development club, a monthly program. I'll be doing a talk with reflective exercise. That's all coming down the tracks starting next february so yeah. it's all it's all go it's all go and i think kieran's going to put a link to that for anybody who's interested he could put a link oh, in the in the fantastic. chat there yeah absolutely so in terms then if we if we get more sort of granular if you like in, in terms of mm. lifestyle and medicine and the six pillars of lifestyle medicine um what if do you want to speak a little bit about them and in the polls actually i'm just going to release some polls here because i want to get more um feedback from everybody here and that is which of the six lifestyle medicine pillars do you feel is the one that needs more attention um is sorry is your strongest is the first one okay so My, let's start with the positive psychology what is your strongest and i have them listed there mark you can see um we have sleep exercise stress management nutrition Avoiding risky substances, which I do want to speak about, and um, alcohol and Christmas, I think, is something mm. we need uh, to give attention to, and then relationships. So let's see what comes back there. And I'll just read uh, some of the polls that came in about Christmas. So 52%, uh, 56% of people are looking forward to it. Only 5% are not, which is great to hear. And 38% say somewhat. Now, when we look at, do you feel overwhelmed by it? We have 27% of people say, yes, they are. 33% say no. And then we have people in the middle at 39%. And that kind of is interesting because what we see there is paradoxes in terms of you may be looking forward to something, but you can also feel overwhelmed by it, which is really at the heart of emotional resilience in terms of being able to hold that really range of emotions and mm. quite often, you know, contrasting emotions to be excited, but also nervous or overwhelmed. And I think, again, that's what Christmas does. It brings up so many, like it's a rainbow of emotions, and that can in itself be overwhelming. So, Mark, in terms of those pillars of lifestyle medicine, the six, I feel like the real student now, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing, I've done my homework and I've really um, studied each one. And would you say as a doctor that one of those is more important than any other like would you put an emphasis on one of them above another for example no, absolutely not okay. because everyone everyone is different if everybody looks at their at their thumbprint right now and your thumbprint is unique to you you're a unique human being and what's what what's right for you is not necessarily right for somebody else and what might as i say close your gap in terms of you know, boosting your emotional resilience or boosting your well-being, maybe completely different from someone else. What I would say is everything is interconnected. Um, I mean, Leonardo da Vinci said it 500 years ago, you know, that everything is interconnected. I mean, Lao Tzu, um, who wrote the Tao Te Ching, he said it 2,500 years ago. So I'm not saying anything too radical. 
uh, <laughs> but it is so true. And there are countless examples of how, um, you know, if you take something like sleep, for example, how more sleep not just improves your physical health, it improves your your mental health, it improves your relationships, it improves your emotional bank account, uh, memory, and so on. So, I mean, everything is everything is so interconnected. So it's really about trying to figure out um, where are you at mm -hmm. in terms of, let's call it the lifestyle pre medicine prescription, mm -hmm. and then seeing what your gaps are, and then trying to figure out, well, what's the one thing I could do that mm -hmm. could move me in that journey of beginning to close my gap? Because it's not about perfection it's not about trying to change too many things too quickly and um, firstly i think you need to answer two questions mm -hmm. with any potential change in your life the first thing is um how important is this change to me because if it's not important um it's not going to happen and you know you need to be able to score that importance on a scale of one to ten and unless it's over seven uh, it's not it's realistically not going to happen and the importance really comes back to how well do you understand how potentially beneficial the change might be so if you take something like sleep which we now know is massively important and you know when i went to medical school there was no talk about sleep only you know staying up all night before exams or whatever but there was no, nothing about sleep and there still is very little known about sleep but you know, there was a brilliant book came out by Matthew Walker a couple of years ago called Why Sleep Matters. And it's I read that book and it changed my whole perspective on sleep as a doctor and not just in terms of me prioritizing my own sleep to get eight hours every night, uh, but in terms of really advocating for that with, with patients. So in terms so in, importance on a scale of one to ten can come back to your knowledge and you might need to understand more the benefits. The great thing is there's a wealth of great knowledge out there now. So, you know, there's no excuses in terms of not finding out about something if you want to find out as long as you go to a credible, authentic source. Yeah. And the second, the second question, Fiona, is how confident am I that I can make the change? Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, if your confidence is 8, 9, 10 out of 10, great, good on you. But if your confidence is less than that, um, you're probably going to need some support. So now you're going to have to start figuring out, well, who could support me to make this important change? Have I got some accountability partners in my own network, like my own friends? Would some friends like to make the change with me? Is there a group I'm part of? Is there maybe I go swimming at the weekends? Maybe I go cycling. Maybe I do my yoga, whatever it might be. Is there a group that can help me with this? So it's really your importance and confidence. They're two important questions. Yeah, and absolutely. After that, then, after that, it's as simple as saying, well, what could I add to my current lifestyle that could enhance my well-being? Mm -hmm. And it could be as simple as having a wind down time at night, mm -hmm. eating, eating more color in your diet each day, mm -hmm. having more micro moments of movement, mm -hmm. spending two or three minutes every evening, writing down three things that went well that day, www. Mm -hmm. It might be slowing your breathing for a minute or two. It might be just literally stilling your mind, whether it's just sitting quietly with all the devices off, mm -hmm. whether it's getting out in nature. Um, or on the other hand, it might be something you you commit to stop doing. Mm -hmm. And that might be you're going to stop abusing alcohol, as you, as you mentioned already. Mm -hmm. Or it might be you're going to stop scrolling on your phone late at night. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to stop going to the cupboard or the fridge after 9 30 at night for the i deserve that i deserve it type situation <laughs> treats are you speaking from experience mark <laughs> um so you know it, it's as, it's as simple as that and it's really about doing something small yes building it, it as a habit and then the magic is time mm. because time passes and if you do something, you know, consistency is the mother of mastery, as they say. And if you do something consistently, it doesn't have to be every day, it doesn't have to be perfection. But if you do it regularly, mm -hmm. it becomes a habit. And over time, it becomes part of the new you. Mm -hmm. And what's really, you know, the, a wise person once said, you know, you will totally overestimate what you can do in 12 months in one year. But you'll underestimate what you can do in five years. And I think that is so true. I've seen that so many times mm -hmm. with patients. 
And I think the big downside about trying to change too much too quickly is mm -hmm. you'll more often than not become overwhelmed. Willpower muscle will get burned out okay. uh, because there's only so much willpower to go around each day. And you'll throw your hands in the air and you say, what the heck? Yeah. So patience is, is, is really important, isn't it? Um, you mentioned the book, the Matthew Walker book, and I, I also read it and absolutely loved it and, and recommend it to everybody here. But um, I'm laughing because a friend of mine, after reading it, I was so adamant on, you know, getting my eight hours and that this was like 100 percent. And it is obviously very important. But she turned to me and she said, Fiona, you're not going to get Alzheimer's if you stay up after 11 o'clock. <laughs> As in, like, you're you're taking this too far. Um, so there is a sense of, um, you know, like, when I look at those six pillars and what I work with with my clients is, personally, I would say that sleep is the bedrock, right? Because I find that if someone isn't sleeping, they're unlikely to be able to, for example, feel calmer. Um, I like your cup, Mark. Think, think happy, be happy, is it? <laughs> think happy, be happy, yeah. <laughs> not toxic positivity just nice general and it's on the other side says it's okay if you don't <laughs> um yes but but the terms of sleep i would say you know is something that it's very hard to help a person to make changes in their life if they're not sleeping well would you agree with that in terms of let's say they want to you know exercise more or they want to improve their their nutrition um or their relationships well, well I think it's I think it's hard. I think I think yes, found, sleep is the foundation stone. And a late uncle of mine, my uncle Brendan, he he was a, a GP, mm -hmm. and I remember him saying when I was a small boy that you know an hour before twelve was worth two hours after. And of course, I didn't really know what it meant, but it was all of this idea about getting getting up to bed at nine o'clock when I was eight or nine years of age that that sleep before midnight was so was so good for you. Yes. And, but it is really, and that was before there was any science. But of course, Benjamin Franklin said early to bed and early to rise makes a man uh, healthy, wealthy and wise. <laughs> but I think you're right. What is interesting about lack of sleep is the, is the impact it has mm -hmm. on your, your, your the stressed state, mm -hmm. your self-control, your willpower gets depleted. Absolutely. You crave garbage calories. There's hormonal changes in your brain that make you more prone to overeat and gain weight and uh, you have less available willpower for doing anything else and uh, of course your concentration attention span all that kind of goes down and mm -hmm. it can be hard for people to appreciate it because we're all living in our own heads mm -hmm. and you're living inside your own skull and you're living with your own reality so you may not really appreciate what's actually going on but i would say to anybody you know conduct i love i love the idea of conducting an experiment because with an experiment, Fiona, there's no right or wrong and there's no sort of sense of um, guilt or failure or anything. You you, ch you try something, you observe what happens, and then mm -hmm. you decide yourself, is it worth continuing with this or not? Mm -hmm. And I would challenge anybody to, to, you know, work on making sure they get a good night's sleep, getting mm -hmm. off technology at a reasonable hour and mm -hmm. keeping your mobile phone downstairs bringing consistently for me as a GP, bringing your mobile phone into your bedroom and people will say, oh, well, sure, I use it to set my alarm or whatever. Mm -hmm. But consistently it keeps people awake. Um, melatonin levels are reduced. So your quality and quantity of sleep are reduced. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as well as that reading stuff late at night, it keeps you in the stressed state and keeps you more prone to worry and ruminate and so on. So Mm. I think you're right. I think I think I think sleep is the bedrock. But for me, I think I think exercise is really and movement. And I, I mean, they are they are separate mm -hmm. as well as being similar. Yes. But simply, you know, simply. I mean, Hippocrates said, if you're in a bad mood, mm -hmm. go for a walk. And if you're still in a bad mood, go for <laughs> another walk, because, you know, movement. Um, I, I the word I use is is emotion. E plus motion equals positive emotion exercise plus movement equals positive emotion simply getting up off the chair and moving for as little as 10 minutes can change your emotional state mm -hmm. and it's interesting as you said at the start about emotional resilience and emotions but emotions are always temporary mm -hmm. but you can bring on a more positive state and sometimes dissolve away 
feelings of of anxiousness uh, through movement. It doesn't have to be anything, you know, like going to the gym or whatever. Simply walking. Mm. Housework is good as well, isn't it? Gardening, these kind of more natural movements when they look at longevity well, in, um, you know, the blue zones across the world. One of the most common things is is actual natural movement and not to underestimate that, how, how beneficial did it you, is. Did you just mention gardening? Yes. Yeah, well, I just did a fascinating uh, podcast. I've a, my podcast is in the doctor's chair and I interviewed Dr. Sue Stewart-Smith. Okay. And it'll be going out in January. She's a wonderful woman, a uh, brilliant lady. She's written a book called The Well-Gardened Mind, which I'd recommend to anybody with an interest in gardening and gardens and nature and health. And it's a really fantastic exposition of the benefits of spending time in nature, which are, are so manifold. I mean, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. And, you know, Beautiful. Being in nature, it calms the amygdala, the red button in the brain. It gives you more mental clarity, makes you feel more creative, mm -hmm. lowers blood pressure, the stress hormone cortisol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is really so good for us. And we're it really it's, it's biophilia. It's a hardwired um, evolutionary response mechanism, uh, largely involving the right half of the brain. And there's brilliant research done on this, how it, it boosts neurochemicals such as serotonin and oxytocin and natural endorphins mm. and natural um, killer cells that support significant boost in your immune system. And mm -hmm. Nature magazine, of course, had that seminal research from the University of Exeter last year that showed that 120 minutes in nature cumulatively over the week, it could be. 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, but two hours over the week mm. is the sort of dose t for a tipping point. And now you're significantly into enhanced well-being territory more than two hours a week. That's not to say that less than that won't help. I think even small doses of nature, not just do you get the well-being benefits from being in nature itself, mm. but of course the natural light and being outdoors helps to retrain your circadian rhythm and your own internal 24 hour body and for clock, sleep so. as well it helps you to sleep yeah it i'm just going to read sleep. the polls here mark and um, just to let yeah. people know so we've got um the the feedback so far is which of the six lifestyle medicine pillars do you feel is your strongest so 32 percent are saying sleep is strong which is great to hear and 19 percent are saying their exercise is strong 10 percent are saying stress management seven percent are saying nutrition 23% are saying avoiding risky substances, which is alcohol, smoking, drugs, etc. Um, and then relationships, people are saying 7% is the strongest. Then in terms of we flip it around, what one, what do people need more attention? What do they need to look after? We're looking at about 18% are saying sleep, 22% are saying exercise, 22% uh, again for stress management and nutrition, 14%. 3.6% are saying uh, avoiding risky substances. So that's okay. That seems to not be, we're, we're not too many um, uh, issues there this evening, which is great. And then relationships are saying 22%. So keep vote, people are voting there now as I'm saying it. Um, so that's really interesting. And it's, it's interesting for people to see how others are doing in different areas, isn't it? And to get that um, sort of overarching uh, sort of uh, information and, and really it's a, a bit of data for us to 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 read the group and see where you're at yourselves and um, so with that yeah sorry go ahead okay. Mark. Yeah. Well, I'll just I'll just talk about relationships for a minute because we are yeah. we are social creatures and we you know we really thrive based on the quality of our of our human and social connections and that that's why as you know Fiona why loneliness really is the most terrible poverty Mm -hmm. And why it can be so destructive for, you know, not just for your sense of emotional vitality, but for your mental health and, and your physical health as well. I mean, it can trigger all sorts of things from heart disease to dementia. So having strong, robust relationships, having people around you that can strengthen and support you and encourage you and maybe challenge you at times is so important. Fascinating study out of Harvard, 236 men it's good the harvard men's study has been going on since 1938 mm. and they're now studying their offspring mm. has found that 
having strong, robust relationships at age 50 okay. is more protective against heart disease than your cholesterol level. So it's, it's, it's really, really, it's really, really strong. Mm, it's amazing. And, yeah, yeah, it is. And it, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges, hasn't it? Um, through this whole, through the pandemic, through lockdowns, is that people are really missing that. And that's why, for example, these kind of events help us to connect with each other and, and why we really need to, to interact and support each other in the best way that we can and what's available to us. And um, because we, like you say, it's just such a, we're such social creatures it's 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 fuel it's nutrition for us isn't it and we need that no man is an island and and that sense of community and belonging i think is really important as well from a self-esteem perspective and um, and there's also research i think that shows that the more time we spend alone you know in terms of that loneliness feeling the more cut off we become and the less our social skills are able to actually connect so mm -hmm. That's something you've, I think you've hit on something really interesting there, Fiona, which is the difference between being lonely and being alone. Mm -hmm. And they are very separate. And it's worth just highlighting that that loneliness is a feeling of being excluded. It's a, you know, a feeling of being apart from the crowd, mm -hmm. whereas some of the most content people you'll ever meet spend considerable periods of time on their own, because when you're alone, you can still the mind when you're alone, you can read. You can think, which is very underrated in today's world. Uh, you can spend time in nature, etc. Uh, so that so many people that spend time alone, and remember that one third of us are naturally introverts anyway. You know, we're not the gregarious extroverts that society pr uh, projects. Um, you know, are can be very well adjusted and not suffer from loneliness mm -hmm. one yeah. little bit. I can vouch for that. I absolutely love going, uh, spending time on my own. I think it's just, it's so, so crucial. And um, it's the, it reminds me of the quote that um, the solution for loneliness is solitude in terms mm. of when we're really have that ability to be so content within ourselves and to, to feel that we are, um, that we have all that we need within ourselves. That's what allows us then to, to connect with others. Um, and I definitely would say I'm probably quite an extrovert person. I love people. But what I also love as much as that is, is time on my own. Would you be similar, Mark? Do you like to have time on your own? Is it important to you? Very important to me. I mean, I spend, you know, in my practice, I most most days I'm seeing patients. So I'm with people all day, but I, I love spending time on my own. I love spending quiet time uh, in nature. I live very near the Mount Congreve Gardens. And I love nothing better than to go down there for a couple of hours yeah. and uh, immerse myself in nature, sitting quietly, um, reading. You know, I think it's lovely. Yeah, it and is. It's, it's, really, very it's, it's a it's a great gift to your well-being to be able to um, do choose to do the things that matter to you because we're mm -hmm. all different. So I'd never try and tell anyone what they should do. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are ideas from science and lifestyle medicine and so on, but. I think you have to get to a stage in your life where you know yourself well enough to know what makes you tick yeah. and know what suits you. And that leads me on to something I really want to talk about, which is the whole area of Christmas and relationships and also alcohol that can, you know, I'm sure you've seen in, in your many years of experience, as I have also, mm. the detriment that alcohol can play in terms of relationships and you know, childhood's completely destroyed and marred by, by um, you know, just the detrimental impact it can have. I'm not, I'm not you know, um, completely against it at all. But what I'm saying is that it is something that I think our society is very much conditioned to, to um, have a dependency on. And I'm just released into the polls there um, two more questions that I'd love to hear. Are you comfortable with your relationship with alcohol, you, with your own relationship? And again, I think we always have to go back to starting with ourselves before we start to look at trying to change anything else. We need to look at our own relationship uh, with, with whatever it may be. And then the second question is, do you have a loved one that you do not feel comfortable with when they drink? OK, so if there's anybody there who's experiencing that. And I suppose, you know, what what would you say, Mark, to to someone who is experiencing um, maybe a sort of sense of dread or anxiety over the Christmas period within that context of relationships? 
and alcohol and not necessarily just alcohol but but the tensions that can arise let's say in between families it's very difficult and but i think a good starting point is is to is to acknowledge and recognize the potential difficulty that's there mm -hmm. uh, it may it may involve you having a, a strategy to deal with certain situations um but at the very least you need to really focus on your own self-care um throughout i mean you know in my work i've been a, a gp now for over 26 years and i mean i would call alcohol it's a good servant but it's a very bad master and i've seen so many people uh who've been destroyed by alcohol who relationships have been destroyed them um, careers uh ended mm -hmm. um, marriages relationships um finances and and sort of the downward spiral from the from the person with the addiction themselves so i mean you're right it, the, there is a culture of where if you don't drink nearly there's something wrong with you in ireland um you, you we treat with suspicion um yeah. and uh you know it's and of course alcohol is a time is, is is just synonymous with christmas mm. and so you know i think if if anyone's listening here um and they are struggling themselves with alcohol um i mean the image of of you know the alcoholic that that's a term i i don't like and it, it's such a stigmatizing word Mm -hmm. uh, and such a judgmental word but mm -hmm. if somebody may have a problem with alcohol in other words if they drink more than they would like to or they'd like to cut down mm -hmm. talk to your family doctor or or talk to a trained counselor go for help mm -hmm. you're never alone there's people there that can help you um you can you know bring in some 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 rules yourself that you're going to have maybe only alcohol on, on three days in the seven uh you're going to you know minim minimize your exposure uh, mm -hmm. maybe if you're going to a party you're going to plan on on driving so obviously you're not going to drink them because you don't drink and drive mm -hmm. um things like that pacing yourself mm -hmm. um but certainly that that mix of of alcohol in in the context maybe of some dysfunctional relationships where there's issues unresolved issues over the years it can be a toxic combination it can and and what we've got here mark just sorry to interrupt but 57 percent of people are saying that they do have a loved one that they do not feel comfortable with when they drink so that's quite mm -hmm. significant oh, over half the people here this evening have that feeling and that's that's not a pleasant feeling um what what would you say to someone in that position because it's 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 more out of their control it's another person that's that's behaving this way so what what do you think a person can do in that situation? What I what I've learned in my own life, um, mm -hmm. Fiona, is that the only person I can ever hope to change is myself. Mm -hmm. I can't change you, uh, not that I want to, uh, <laughs> but I can't change I can't change anybody really. I can give advice, I can help, listen, I can support. Um, uh, you know, so we we need to put much more energy into either changing um, some aspect of ourselves we're not happy with. Mm -hmm. or or maybe it's it, we need to uh work on our tolerance and acceptance of those things in life that we can't change Absolutely. which includes other people if it's a loved one you can be there to support them you can encourage them to seek help mm -hmm. and there are so many ways um i mean i wrote in my I, my first book was called the men's health book that came out about 13 years ago and i had a chapter about alcohol in there mm -hmm. and i spoke about how alcohol can cause more than 66 separate medical conditions uh so so it's it's like the great mimicker people think about cirrhosis of the liver and things like that but really that's generally end stage people f forget about the, the the memory lapses the high blood pressure the heartburn the gout um the 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 weight gain the belly fat you know the sort of more insidious brain mm -hmm. fog that that alcohol can bring on the anxiety the panic attacks the low mood Mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts you know the mm -hmm. low self-esteem um you know which can be devastating i mean as i say sometimes would say to people in my room you know if you if you got a frog um not, not that i'm against frogs or anything but if you got a frog and threw him into a pot of boiling water mm -hmm. um he'd just jump out straight away right mm -hmm. but if you put the frog and i'm not suggesting this uh, but frogs but if you put him into cold water and turned up the heat very slowly 
that poor frog will be burned, will be boiled alive. Yeah. By and, and alcohol can do that to people. It can just boil you alive very slowly and you're not aware of it. You, you don't have the insight. So sometimes, so yeah. sometimes it does take a loved one or somebody who cares mm -hmm. to sort of give somebody some uh, feedback about what their uh, alcohol or their drinking problem drinking is doing to the family or doing the situation. But that can be tricky mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. do without causing, uh, you know, without causing um, a, a kind of a negative situation, for want of a better word. So it's about choosing your timing yeah, uh, absolutely. carefully. And uh, there's a time for everything, as they say, and it's maybe sometimes getting some outside help, whether you go to, for counseling yourself mm -hmm. um, or whether you get some support. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, the, the beautiful saying, uh, Nyber, you know, God grant me the courage to change what I can, accept what I can't change and the wisdom to know the difference. Very important. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mark, what I want to do for, for everyone here this evening in a few minutes now is a, a lovely live hypnotherapy where I'm going to help us to have a, a beautiful mental rehearsal, let's say, of how we want Christmas to be. So before I do that, let's just look at how, again, in my experience, a lot of people can carry the weight, let's say, of Maybe Christmas is that word so good in the past. It could be a grief, a loss. It could be childhood difficulties. And that can taint, let's say, how we feel about Christmas today. So carrying the past with them can sometimes create unnecessary um, turmoil, you know, psychologically. Like you were saying, Mark, earlier, you know, about the fire and how it was only that moment when you deci decided to let it go that you were not going to try to keep on mm. trying to dig deeper. Why did this happen? But the amazing power of acceptance there is what allowed you to, to let go and literally, quite literally, flourish under fire, um, which I know Maureen Gaffney speaks a lot about, that, that ability to, to take the, the very difficult things in our lives and turn them around. So I just have two more questions for the polls, and then we're going to, to, to do the hypnotherapy, as I said. So... Um, what I'd like to know is, do you feel you are holding on to past Christmas tensions and or trauma? And at the moment, 56% of people are saying, yes, they are. OK. And then would you like to let this go? Uh, we have 62% saying yes. Well, that's that's a very good start once you want to let it go. And then I asked, um, yes, I would. However, I'm not sure how to. OK, so that's 27% percent of people saying yes they would like to but they're not sure how so what I would like to address in the hypnotherapy is just some suggestions to help people with that and we can see that over half the people here are carrying that um, and then also to get an idea just at the beginning of of the call here this evening I asked people you know what are their favorite parts of Christmas and what I'd love to do is just help everyone to to start tapping into let's say some of the more positive memories that we have around Christmas um, from maybe it's our childhood, maybe it's, you know, when our children were born, maybe it's it's a period in our lives where you get that lovely warm glow, let's say, that, that Christmas can bring. And maybe just start sharing some of those memories, you know, was it running down the stairs, for example, um, to find, you know, the presents from Santa? Um, I have wonderful memories of my own childhood of uh, going to Belfast. My grandmother lived in Belfast and, you know, just the amazing love and, and, and atmosphere in the home was was unforgettable. Um, and that excitement of, of, of going to or not or trying to go to sleep, but being so, you know, absolutely over the top excited about what what was Santa going to bring and running down and seeing seeing all the gifts there so all of that is within us and like you were saying Mark we've got to in terms of positive emotions they are like Teflon in the brain and we need to really um train ourselves to soak them in and that's another uh, area I know Barbara Fredrickson talks about in terms of literally um absorbing them and that positively positivity offset that we we have to actually consciously allow ourselves to soak them in so let's let's get the chat going here with some positive memories and you might share one yourself Mark of what you um, what brings say, to your mind what you said there Fiona was about positive yeah. emotions and what's interesting is that we 
we need to hear positive feedback continuously for at least 12 seconds before we consider it important enough to remember. So okay. That's a really, really interesting idea that they, they are that fleeting, even in terms of our own minds, in terms of what we appreciate uh, as being as being positive. But um, I was just thinking back to uh, you were talking about Christmas and going to Belfast. So I was actually my parents, unfortunately, they're both deceased now. But I was actually thinking back to um, when I was five years old in our house in Waterford mm -hmm. and um, going down and getting my present under the tree. And it was a watch. I got a watch for Christmas. I was oh, five. <laughs> lovely. Yeah. And I was wow. so excited. What, what is such an adult pr present, isn't it? Such a big boy a thing watch. to have. Yeah. And, and, and chocolate and that. I was, I was back there while you were talking about Belfast. I was back there under that tree again. So there you go. Yeah, it's not lovely. And what happens, mm. as you know yourself, that that starts to change your biology just by mm. allowing yourself to soak in that memory and to stay you know, with it. Reminiscing yeah. uh, and, and savoring, savoring good times and then re re reminiscing, thinking back. I mean, I'm just thinking in real. I mean, it really is one of the lovely things about looking back on old photographs, family holidays, things like that it can be really lovely. It really can. You're absolutely spot on. And there's some lovely comments coming in here. I'd love to read some of them. So Christine says, walking down our town when my three children were small and the three of them singing Christmas songs, a lovely memory. And even just reading other people's memories, like you do, mm. you start to feel it yourself, which is which is is, is so lovely. Uh, Marie says, walking to midnight mass one Christmas Eve with my mum when I was young, it was a cold, bright, frosty night and it felt magical. Just thinking that Santa would be coming. Wow, that's gorgeous. Um, there's lots of beauty, helping my mum make Christmas biscuits and um, singing Christmas songs in the car, driving to my granddad's house. Gorgeous, Alison. Uh, there's my own mum here. Thanks for being here, mum. She says, having my family around me and seeing their happy faces especially when we have been a bit isolated during COVID. There you go, mum. Thanks for that. Um, I feel the same. Caroline, how are you? Lovely you're here. My, uh, she says, my now grown up children hearing Santa on the roof. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, who was up there, Caroline? Was it, was it your husband or God knows who was up there? <laughs> um, okay, so there's lots coming in there. And that's the, that, that, that's, these are the kind of emotions that I want to help us to, to create and cultivate. So without further ado, I'm going to just spend five minutes or so bringing us on this lovely little journey um, to help us. And then we will get to the top questions, Mark, if that's OK. And then we will wrap up. So stay with us. You're all doing great. And it's, it's just so wonderful to have you here. So I'm just going to pop on a little bit of music um, and let's see. <laughs> Should be going through. Okay, so let's close our eyes, everybody, and just start to connect inwards. So take this time to really drop in to your heart and into your home. Just allowing all of the different insights that we've been sharing here this evening to settle in. And just like Mark said, that perhaps there's one thing, just one, that resonates with you and that will stay. We're going to take three very deep breaths. And the deeper we breathe, the more relaxed we become, the more open we become, the more we create the energy that we need to be emotionally resilient this festive season. The ability to connect the people we love comes from the ability to connect to ourselves first and foremost. So let's breathe into the belly to deep as we can, right in for one. And as you exhale, I want you to just imagine you're letting go of anything and everything you need to release. That could be stresses and strains from the day. Or as we breathe in again for two, 
and you exhale, it could be stresses and strains from long, long ago. We're just starting to clear it out. As you begin to open your heart space to receive positive suggestions. Breathing in for three. Make it deep and then a lovely long exhale. As you release and let go. Creating the stillness and space. As you connect into that particular memory of a magical Christmas time. And just notice what happens when you allow yourself to dwell in that space, to remember the sounds. Perhaps it was the laughter of children. Perhaps it was the crackling of an open fire. Allow yourself to breathe in the aromas, the scents of Christmas, of that time in your life. Allow yourself to re-experience the childlike excitement that still remains within you. Allow that to shine. Allow that to guide you. And I want you to imagine that you're literally capturing that feeling and placing it as deep as you can into your own heart so that it remains. You can even take your hand to your heart to feel that sense of this beautiful memory becoming stronger, allowing that memory to guide you into your present moment, into this Christmas, 2021. To allow yourself each time you see a Christmas light, whether it's on a tree, a window shop, wherever it might be, I want you to remember this feeling and let this feeling be the thing the energy that you share with everyone you encounter, from your loved ones, to the strangers in the street, to share it with the people that need it most, the people who may not be alone, but feel lonely. Can we extend that energy to every person on this call this evening to send a feeling of joy and love so that we are connected in this community. So allow that to really soak in and notice that when you stay with the positive emotion that you have so much more control than you may ever have imagined over your own ability to create that feeling inside. This is your power. This is your strength. This is your life. In a moment, I'll count upwards from one to three. And you can imagine maybe perhaps your heart opening that little bit more, an internal smile. Your heart smiles as we enter into this festive period. I'll count to three and our eyes will open. So one, two, and three. In your own time, opening up your eyes. And there we go. So hopefully we all have a lovely, nice, warm glow there. And I'm gonna go just to the questions here, Mark, and, um, Let's see the top votes. We have 25 votes for this uh, first question. That is stepping away from self-critical talk. How could that be achieved? So how can we step away from self-critical talk? What would you say to that, Mark? 
I might throw in my own tuppence there afterwards, but you go ahead. Well, I think, you know, quietening your inner, your inner critic, or as I, as I call them, you know, the, the merry go mind of, of anxious, negative thoughts. Um, for me, the best way to do that is, you know, to wrap your arms around yourself in terms of, you know, really practicing self-compassion in terms of, you know, as we said earlier, treating yourself with the same empathy and kindness and support as you would a good friend. Uh, but I, I believe, you know, a, a mindful practice is a wonderful way to still the mind and to, you know, because we have maybe up to 50, 60,000 thoughts a day, most of them negative. Mm -hmm. And some of us are just more prone to ruminate. And that's one of the things about being in nature, you know, quiet time in nature, it, it turns off the um, sort of, it does turn off the inner critic, you know, the depressive ruminations, uh, an area of the brain called the subgenual cortex becomes quietened. And you move from the busyness of your beta waves of your mind to a more alpha, chilled out, relaxed state. So any mindful practice, whether it's actually being in nature, slowing your breathing like you just did there so beautifully. Um, I have a pause technique on my own website, uh, which is really all about simply consciously becoming more aware of your breath. You can then move on to things like meditation. That can be a wonderful way to um, quieten your, your inner critic. And, and then something I'm a big fan of, which I probably should have mentioned earlier, this idea of writing things down, emotional journaling is a tremendous technique. I interviewed James Pennebacher on my podcast in the doctor's chair about how, you know, writing down everything that you're stressed, worried, anxious, concerned about for 15, 20 minutes a day for three days in a row after the three days, tear it up, don't show it to anyone else, kind of a lasting benefit on your well-being. But a daily gratitude practice, you know, it isn't possible to feel grateful on the one hand and stressed, tense, anxious or hostile on the other. And it mm. really can be a great way to dissolve feelings of 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 toxic stress and to really allow you to reframe in the moment that that critic and mm. perhaps turn your inner critic into more of an inner coach. Lovely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's some really good practical tips in there. I think that's wonderful. And acceptance, Mark, is mm. is, is is the, the beginning. Yeah. Um, I mean, three, three of the big things in positive psychology are accepting the past. The mm -hmm. three A's accept the past, appreciate the present moment and anticipate the future with a sense of realistic optimism. Mm, yeah, optimism is, is is incredibly important, isn't it? Um, okay, we're going to finish up in a moment now. So we'll just one more question. And um, how can we be kind to ourselves while trying our best not to be triggered by family comments at this difficult time of the year? So I might address that for a moment because I think it is it's mm. something I see a lot of um, in my work in terms of, of helping people. Um, and I also wrote an article just recently about this for the Business Post. And it's, it's, oh, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, it was a, a reader who um, felt that their mother was, mother-in-law, excuse me, was really, really um, critical. And how were they going to cope with that? Mm. And really, what I would say is that it takes a huge amount of courage uh, to mm. deal with that with those in particular um close relationships a parental um you know a, a parent who's been very critical is very very difficult and being honest is actually one thing that people tend to stay away from from fear they can go back to maybe feeling like a child again and the the fear that they're going to be ostracized or um scolded in some way mm -hmm. so depending on the nature of the relationship i do think that we we need to have boundaries and i think that it can be done in a way that is actually very compassionate that a, that it, it doesn't have to be conflict i'm very i love to, the idea that we can have a conversation and um, that comes from the heart and that it isn't a conflict. So when you feel that someone is, is being uh, difficult towards you, you have the courage to address it in a way that we, we tend not to do. We tend to suppress it. And that's why I think Christmas brings up a lot of things because now there's nowhere to hide. It's like you might sort of distract yourself all year round. And now all of a sudden you're in the same place at the same time. And that's where things can get uh, messy. Um, so I'm afraid we're going to, I'm going to finish up because it is quarter to nine. 
and you've all been so faithful and so gorgeous for staying with us for the evening. Um, just to say, Mark, I am so grateful to you. You are an absolute joy. Like you radiate. I, I can't tell you how much I, I love listening to you. I just keep learning from you. I love your podcast. I recommend everybody here to um, listen to it regularly. It's fun. You have such a beautiful style with people. Uh, like you said yourself, um, you know, you, you interviewed the tea shop just last week, I think, or, or very recently. Mm -hmm. And what you said is that you like you, you like to bring the best out on people. And I really think you do that. You, you just have a natural way and, and uh, ability to do that, which is such a skill. Um, and I, I think it comes from your ability to listen and to explain you've got such a, a, a lovely way so if it, if it isn't clear enough i'm absolutely in awe and delighted that you're, you you uh, agreed to come here this evening and share your wisdom yeah, and... it's, absol it's absolutely my pleasure if you like i have a very short poem called soul breath that yes. i wrote a few years ago and i'd love to share it with your listeners for christmas and um, it takes do. about 40 seconds if if that's okay yes, with the technical yes, experts. <laughs> Stay with us, everyone. Yes. Soul breath. Let's soul let's... breath. So it's a poem I wrote a few years ago after time in Mount Congreve, and it goes something like this. May the breath of your soul be your wisdom guide. May the beacon of your soul bring respite inside. May you bring presence to all that you do. May care and compassion be that which is you. May you have the gift of wisdom and staying awake. May each dawn bring you presence not to forsake. And dusk find you grateful for the helter skelter. May night bring security, serenity of shelter. As day turns to night and month turns to year, may the passing of time bring you less fear. Each day you toil, as life's depths take their toll. May loveliness and light bring breath to your soul. Wow. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, Mark. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you for that. That is so uplifting and really captures so much of what we were speaking about this evening. So just to finish and say, you can check out Mark's podcast. Also, his self, his new courses that are coming up. Um, please do look at drmarkrow.com. Dot com is that or dot ie am i correct dot com dot com yeah dot com dot kieran com. will put it there i want to thank kieran who's behind the scenes my beautiful you, uh, partner in life and business and in everything thank you kieran and just to say as well this third webinar of this series is going to be in february so no doubt you'll hear from me about it and um my guest will be someone new um and each time it, it seems impossible to to get anyone as as good as the last pat dibley was amazing mark Rowe, you've been fantastic and just to say anyone here as well that if you're looking to get help with public speaking i have a workshop starting in um january and there are places available on that if anyone is interested in um performing and presenting at their best because it's something a lot of people do have um a lot of nerves and anxiety around so it's it's particularly focused on the anxiety around public speaking so thank you so much everyone for being here happy happy christmas it's going to be a great one uh keep that feeling with you that's what I, my gift our gift to you is to keep that feeling and uh let it share it with everyone that you encounter that's the the, the positive ripple effect um is so powerful so thank you mark and um everybody sleep well after that and lots and lots of love thank you everyone thank you fiona Bye, Mark. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <clears throat>